that my next speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eris Sahakian from USC. And Eris is going to talk to us about achalasia a little bit more. And in terms of the question is, is POEM really the clear choice versus our other options that we have for management of achalasia and esophageal motility disorders? So Eris, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. And if we can have Dr. Sahakian's slides, thank you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Jacques, and the other course directors for inviting me to speak today. It's uh, really an honor to be here today. My name is Ara Sahakian. I work at USC, and uh, I'm going to be talking about poem today and is poem the clear choice. And um, I've given this lecture on poem several times, but what I really want to focus on today is uh, the question, is poem uh, the right choice? Because I think that tends to be a, a difficult one for most gastroenterologists out there. So these are my disclosures. Okay, so to really discuss POEM, um, I think we really have to understand achalasia. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about achalasia, which is the main disease we treat with POEM, although we have started treating some other disorders with POEM. Uh, but achalasia is a neurodegenerative motility disorder of the esophagus, which results in progressive dysphagia and regurgitation. And the hallmarks of achalasia are that we see lack of lower esophageal sphincter peristalsis, uh, relaxation, as well as absent peristalsis. And if there's anything that you're gonna take away from this lecture today, if you're, for example, looking at taking the boards, um, this is probably the most important thing to learn in terms of achalasia. Achalasia is a relatively rare disease. We're seeing an incidence of about 1.6 in 100,000. It does not discriminate between men and women and can occur at any age. Uh, usually what we see, at least in the United States, is primary achalasia, which is idiopathic. Uh, we think this is caused by an inflammation of, uh, of the myenteric plexus and degeneration of those nerves, and you can see that between the uh, circular and longitudinal muscle layers here of the esophagus, we see this plexus of nerves. Uh, of course, we know that there's secondary achalasia, and we always want to watch out for uh, pseudoachalasia, which is a tumor, uh, the G junction, which can result in an achalasia-like picture, which we don't want to miss. And we all remember from medical school that Chagas disease uh, related to trypanosoma cruzi infection can also cause achalasia. So how does achalasia present? Well, it tends to be a gradual onset. So uh, those of you in practice often, I'm sure, will see, like I do, that patients will come to you and say that they've already had dysphagia for a few years. And they don't really seek treatment because it tends to sort of come on slowly. Uh, but then they'll come to you and they'll say, well, doctor, now I'm really just taking liquids. I can't even eat solid foods anymore. Uh, the most common symptom is dysphagia to solids and liquids, which, which occurs in about 90% of patients. Regurgitation is also common. But we frequently also see patients presenting with heartburn. So you'll see sometimes the patients will tell you that they were diagnosed with heartburn, they were started on PPIs, and they didn't respond. And their symptoms continued to get worse and worse. And those are the patients that you really want to start working up and doing a motility workup and looking for something like achalasia. Aspiration and cough, relatively uncommon. Weight loss reported in about 20%, although anecdotally, I'll tell you that I see weight loss in a little bit more, uh, I think, than 20% of these patients, especially those that have, had, have been dealing with it for a long time. So how do we make a diagnosis of achalasia? Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to rule out pseudoachalasia and make sure these patients don't have a tumor or a cancer. So we do an upper endoscopy. In patients that are uh, a lot older um, or patients um, who have a lot of weight loss, I may do a CT scan or an EUS to make sure we're not dealing with a submucosal tumor or mass. And uh, of course, we want to do a manometry to find the typical findings of achalasia, which we'll talk about also. And a barium esophagram is also an important part of the workup. And uh, what we can see there is a couple of things. So here we see kind of the typical picture of achalasia in this picture on the left where we see a dilated esophagus and your classic bird's beak, which is really pathognomonic of achalasia. But we, what we can also find is this really tortuous esophagus here, which we call a sigmoid esophagus. And that's important to, to find because that can really start to change our treatment plan. Okay, so uh, if we want to understand the abnormal manometry and the different types of achalasia, we first have to understand the normal manometry. So up here in green, we're looking at the upper esophageal sphincter. Uh, we see the swallow here, where we have decreased pressure. And then we see this beautiful wave of peristalsis here, which helps propel the food down the esophagus. And importantly, we're seeing this relaxation down here uh, during this period of peristalsis in the lower esophageal sphincter, which allows our 
food bolus to pass into the stomach. So now we're looking at type 1 achalasia. So what do we see in type 1 achalasia? The answer is nothing. So we see our initial swallow, but then we see no peristalsis. And importantly, we don't see any relaxation in the lower esophageal sphincter down here after the swallow. What about type 2 achalasia? So very similar to type 1 achalasia, but instead of seeing absolutely no pressure here, we're still seeing a lack of propulsive peristalsis, but we're seeing these bars uh, of pressurization. So we call this panesophageal pressurization. Um, but this is still non-propulsive. And uh, we're seeing, again, importantly, this, this um, lack of relaxation down here at the lower esophageal sphincter. And in type 3, again, relatively similar findings. The basics are the same. We're seeing a lack of relaxation. But now we're seeing this really intense spasm in the distal two-thirds of the esophagus where our smooth muscle is. Uh, and that's really typical of type 3 achalasia. So why is this important? Uh, especially when we're, when we're treating, um, uh, treating these disorders, it does become important. And uh, here, this is data looking at the uh, European achalasia trial, uh, which compared laparoscopic heller myotomy to pneumatic dilation. And they sort of lumped them together and separated them out in terms of uh, types of achalasia. And what they saw was that in type 1 achalasia, there was an 81% response rate, 96% response rate in type 2, and a relatively lower response rate in type 3 achalasia, which is a little bit unfair to the laparoscopic Heller group because they actually responded better than the pneumatic dilation group. Uh, but the type 3s, I think, are an important area to look at in terms of POEM, uh, and where we think POEM might be a little bit more beneficial than surgery or balloon dilation. And we'll get into that a little bit later in terms of why that is. So what are our treatment options for achalasia? Well, we know there's no cure. So we tell patients that we address the lower esophageal sphincter uh, and the pressure at the lower esophageal sphincter, and we let gravity take care of the rest. So I always tell my patients that I'm not going to be able to make them 100% better, and I'm not going to be able to fix their peristalsis problem. But I can make them maybe 75% better, and that's usually enough so that they can eat pretty normally. So our treatment options, number one, are Heller myotomy with a door fundoplication, which is an anterior 180 degree fundoplication, a peroral endoscopic myotomy, pneumatic balloon dilation, and then Botox and medications, which we know have limited uh, efficacy in terms of treating this disorder. So in terms of a Heller myotomy, what are the advantages? Well, uh, a very precise myotomy can be performed. This surgery is performed through the abdomen, so uh, that, that myotomy can be extended into the cardia very easily, and a fundoplication can be performed at the same time, which really addresses the reflux issue. The disadvantages are uh, pain, hospital stay usually about three to five days, the usual morbidities and complications associated with surgery, and again, in those type three patients, this surgery is not done through the chest, so a long myotomy cannot be performed for the type three patients. Pneumatic balloon dilation, the advantage being that it's a rapid procedure, it's a relatively quick recovery. Uh, these patients can usually go home the same day. However, the disruption of the lower esophageal sphincter is uncontrolled. So the perforation rate uh, with larger balloon dilation has been found to be up to 4%. Um, and patients can have uh, recurrence of symptoms frequently and need repeated procedures. Well, what about Botox? The good thing about Botox is it's quick, it's easy to do, it's minimally invasive. But the disadvantages are that the durability of the response is very poor. These patients usually need repeated treatments every couple of months. Uh, and also important to remember is that this does cause fibrosis at the G junction. So if we are thinking about doing a poem at a later time, it can make it much more difficult to do a poem. And unfortunately, I learned from experience that if you do poem very soon after a Botox injection, within a few weeks, it can be very, very difficult. So if you are going to do it after a Botox injection, I would advise waiting for a couple of months. Uh, it is useful in people who are elderly or in comorbid conditions. We've used this sometimes in uh, patients with end-stage uh, liver disease and cirrhosis who have achalasia um, that basically nobody wants to do surgery or endoscopic therapy. And I think it's also become useful in those cases who have achalasia that's sort of indeterminate. And, and you look at the manometry, we can't make a clear diagnosis, and you don't want to go ahead with a poem or, or, or some other treatment unless you really know what's going on. So we do a Botox. We see if they respond, and I've had patients that tell me, doctor, I'm all better, and then two months later, again, they're really having a lot of symptoms. So this goes against what I told you, told you before to not use Botox. Sometimes we do use Botox in those situations to see if patients respond, but we do give it a few months after that 
uh, to sort of let that fibrosis get a little bit better before we go in and do a poem. So, how do we do a poem? Well, the great thing about poem <clears throat> is it uh, combines an endoscopic and a surgical approach. So, we make a mucosotomy, which is basically an incision in the mucosa, which you can see here. Uh, this is in the mid-esophagus. Depending on what type of achalasia, that will determine where you make your mucosotomy. Often, we start a little bit more distal in our type 1 and type 2 patients. We tunnel through the walls of the esophagus into the submucosal layer, and then we can approach that muscularis propria layer of the... Uh, of the GE junction and the distal esophagus, and we can perform a myotomy selectively into the circular layer uh, and, and at least one or two centimeters into the cardia uh, to really get a good robust myotomy there. And then of course at the end we go back and we close our tunnel so that we don't have a leak. So the advantages are that we can perform a very precise myotomy. Uh, it's an endoscopic approach, so the recovery is relatively quick. Patients generally go home the next day. Uh, and it's a relatively short duration, so these uh, procedures can be performed generally in one to two hours. The disadvantage is, is that uh, it does require significant endoscopic expertise, generally in ESD. Uh, uh, extensive training is needed, so usually with live porcine models. You need significant backup to do these procedures in terms of thoracic surgery, vascular, interventional radiology. So these procedures are usually performed at tertiary centers. Uh, and generally, a fundoplication is not performed in the same setting. So we do have issues with reflux after this procedure. Dr. Chang nicely talked about the TIF procedure, which can be very useful after POEM in controlling reflux, uh, although it's generally not done concurrently. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of POEM. Initially, this was performed in a porcine model by Dr. Pashrika. It was performed in four pigs as a proof of concept. And then by Dr. Inoue in humans in 2008, and a series was published in 2010 showing that this is safe and effective in humans. Well, what are the potential complications of POEM? <clears throat> so bleeding, uh, again, there, there are two different approaches, anterior and posterior. Um, in terms of bleeding in the esophageal part of the procedure, relatively not a lot of big vessels in the esophagus, although when you get down to the G junction in the cardia, we can find relatively large vessels. Uh, and of course, with anterior, a little bit more risk in terms of vascularity than posterior. Um, again, capnoperitoneum and capnomediastinum can happen, and uh, if it's just to a small degree, I just consider that part of the procedure, and I warn our radiologists and our medicine teams that if you get an x-ray, you are going to see some degree of gas uh, in the abdomen or in the chest, and that's normal. Uh, if there's a large degree of capnoperitoneum, that can easily be resolved with a needle decompression. Again, mucosal injury, this is what we're really trying to avoid because if we uh, have a mucosal injury, then we now have a full thickness perforation. Um, this generally, if it happens, can be repaired with clips or if it's a large injury, uh, an esophageal, covered esophageal stent or endoscopic suturing can be used. Rare, um, severe adverse events are relatively rare, but things that can happen are peritonitis, mediastinitis, dehiscence of the closure, delayed bleeding, and pneumothorax. So this is a, a video here I'd like to play you. Quickly, uh, this is actually a bunch of my early poem procedures that I've spliced together. So uh, we're doing a submucosal injection here. I usually start with about five cc's or so of saline with methylene blue. And I'm making a longitudinal incision here. Usually we start in the distal esophagus if it's a type one or two patient. If it's a type three, we start much more proximally depending on the manometry findings. So we're seeing, um, we're nicely seeing our muscularis propria circular fibers right here, and we're in the submucosal layer. This sort of uh, broken glass appearance down here um, shows us uh, the submucosa. And uh, notice that we're dissecting right up against that muscle layer and really trying to expose that muscle layer, which delineates our anatomy, and trying to stay very far away from the mucosa. Now we've got a couple of, of blood vessels here um, that we're really kind of isolating uh, so that we can coagulate these vessels. Now, usually I'd probably just kind of go through those with a knife, but for the purpose of this video, we're, we're coagulating those with a coag grasper. And the coag grasper is a really great tool that can be used in many different situations, not just POEM. Um, and now what we're doing is, is what we call the double scope technique. And uh, what we do is we leave our endoscope in the cardia. I'll pause this for just a minute here. We leave it in the tunnel, and we put down a second endoscope, which is an ultra-slim scope, into the stomach, and we retroflex it. And then we can see our light here in the cardia, and this really helps us to know 
if we've gotten deep enough into the cardia before we go ahead and start doing our myotomy. And there are other ways to know if you're in the cardia, but I found this to be really the most reliable method. And I think if you're just starting out in poem, it's best to do this every time to get a good feeling of when you're deep enough into the cardia. And then start doing your myotomy. Because the last thing you really want to do is uh, do your myotomy and then realize you haven't gone far enough and have to dissect further. And that's when patients really end up getting a lot of gas in the abdomen or in the chest. So what are the outcomes of POEM? Well, let's look at some long-term outcomes. This is a retrospective study of over 200 patients, uh, long-term follow-up. And what they found was that there was clinical success in a high degree of these patients. So at two years, 91% of, of these patients had clinical success. And they found no difference in terms of the achalasia subtypes. They did find that pneumatic dilation was associated with treatment failure, prior pneumatic dilation, with an odds ratio of over three. They also found reflux in 27% and esophagitis in 18%. I'll tell you that based on other studies, that's probably lower than what's been found in other studies. And procedure-related adverse events in about 8.2%. Um, again, I think anecdotally, we, we probably don't see adverse events in, in that many patients, especially severe adverse events. But that, of course, depends on how the study's defining adverse events. So this is a major study, and now we're starting to look at comparative studies of uh, POEM versus pneumatic dilation for treatment of achalasia. And this is a randomized multi-center study with long-term follow-up. They had over 100 patients and they looked at POEM versus pneumatic dilation, uh, which was with a 30 millimeter balloon initially, subsequently with a 35 millimeter balloon uh, if needed. And they looked at clinical success. And what they found was clinical success in 92% of patients who underwent POEM procedure versus 54 uh, percent in patients who underwent pneumatic dilation. So clearly finding in this prospective randomized multi-center study um, that POEM is more effective than pneumatic dilation. On the flip side, what you find is that this is a spectrum where if your treatment is more effective at the G junction, you're also going to find more reflux. So reflux es esophagitis in 41 percent in POEM versus 7 percent in the pneumatic dilation group. So this is our hallmark study from the New England Journal of Medicine a randomized prospective trial looking at POEM versus Heller myotomy with door fund application. It was an open label non-inferiority study. Uh, outcome looking at Eckhart score less than or equal to three, which is standard in most of these studies in terms of the outcome with a long-term follow-up. So they compared over 100 patients with POEM, post, uh, undergoing POEM to over 100 patients undergoing, uh, undergoing laparoscopic Heller myotomy. And what they found was that clinical success rates at two years were relatively similar. Uh, about 83% versus 81.7%. And they did find non-inferiority in terms of efficacy of these procedures. Uh, systemic ad uh, severe adverse events were less in the POEM group, 2.7% versus 7.3% in the laparoscopic Heller group, uh, but this was not a, a statistically significant finding. Um, but again, uh, much more reflux esophagitis in the POEM group, 57% versus 20% in the laparoscopic Heller group. Interestingly, after two years, that did start to kind of come together a little bit, 44% versus 29%, which potentially may be due to that door fund application, maybe loosening up a little bit over time. So let's talk about when we want to use POEM rather than laparoscopic Heller myotomy. Uh, and this really comes to the, the crux of the question of this talk. Well, clearly when patients are unfit for surgery, patients who are older, patients who have multiple comorbidities, patients who've had multiple prior surgeries, uh, which would make the um, laparoscopic Heller myotomy much, much more difficult and more risky. And I think we have emerging evidence now to show that in the patients with type three achalasia, that the POEM is probably a more useful procedure because of the ability to do that very long myotomy and we can, and what I do actually is I look at the manometry with our motility specialist, and that really allows me to tailor the myotomy to uh, our, our um, motility study. So uh, there was a study, a meta-analysis, which looked at uh, different subtypes of achalasia um, and uh, clinical outcomes after POEM, and with type three achalasia, uh, they saw that in terms of POEM versus laparoscopic Heller, they saw success rates of 93% with POEM versus 71% with laparoscopic Heller, with an odds ratio of 3.5 showing that it was more effective with the POEM group. So which patients do we think that we should refer to surgery? Uh, well, I think patients that we think are at the highest risk of reflux. So we don't generally think of hiatal hernia 
uh, associated with achalasia, but it can happen. And we can see in this x-ray a patient with achalasia with a large hiatal hernia. And these are patients um, that probably need reduction of that hiatal hernia, or they're really going to suffer from the reflux. And these are patients that should probably be referred for surgery so that uh, the hiatal hernia can be repaired and uh, fundoplication, fundoplication can be performed concurrently. What about patients with large esophageal diverticulum? Well, uh, you can do a poem on those patients, but you can't fix the diverticulum. Um, so I think in those patients, uh, surgically a diverticulectomy can also be performed. Um, so in those patients, often they should, be, they should usually be referred to surgery. And what about sigmoid esophagus? Well, classically, these patients were referred to surgery. Uh, often the surgeons will do a heller myotomy as sort of a last resort uh, before going to an esophagectomy because often these patients don't respond to treatment at the lower esophageal sphincter. But I will say that with increasing experience, we can do POEM in these patients too. Uh, we can start very distal in the esophagus and target the GE junction. So we can sort of get that same effect as a laparoscopic Heller myotomy. So I do think um, that if, if the endoscopic expertise is there, I would not advise doing a sigmoid esophagus on your first few cases of POEM because it's much more difficult. Um, but I do think this one can go either way to Heller myotomy or to POEM as a last resort before subjecting the patient to an esophagectomy. So I'll finish up here because I'm running out of time. Um, but in patients, what about in the, the healthy, otherwise healthy patient with type 1 or 2 achalasia? Well, that really depends on the patient. And I like to have a conversation with a patient um, and discuss all the risks and benefits of all, and alternatives of all the different methods. Uh, and they can go ahead and, and make the decision. So this is a, a, a nice um, chart here that, that I, I borrowed um, from this paper in uh, CGH. And it gives a, a little bit of a, I think it helps in terms of a guideline in terms of uh, who to target towards different types of therapy. So in this laparoscopic Heller group, we're really, I think, looking at patients um, who you're concerned that uh, you're really going to have to deal with significant reflux, and patients who may not want to stay on PPIs uh, long term. And I'll tell you that, that most of these patients who undergo POEM can be managed very well on PPIs, and, and many of them are very happy to take PPIs. Um, but there are some younger patients who don't want to be on PPIs, and, and they may be better for the laparoscopic Heller group. I think for the type 3 patients, we have increasing evidence that they should probably be uh, more so in the POEM group, and of course, patients who are at high risk of having surgeries that have had previous surgery. And again, this obesity group, I think, is important, um, uh, the severely obese patients. Um, and you do, surprisingly, in achalasia, see patients sometimes that are obese, um, that surgery might be a little bit more challenging, uh, so they can be easily treated with POEM. And uh, pneumatic dilation, again, you want to look at that in terms of patients who are older in age uh, and have significant comorbidities, but I think more and more many of us are moving those patients into the POEM group because of that concern that pneumatic dilation has really an uncontrolled disruption, and we really don't want to see a perforation in those patients um, that have significant comorbidities. And Botox really just being reserved uh, for patients who need temporary therapy, like uh, patients who are pregnant, patients who are on temporary antiplatelets or anticoagulants. And I've also used this in some pre-transplant cirrhotics that we want to avoid interventions where we do Botox until they get a liver transplant and can later then go for either a surgery or a POEM procedure. So in summary, POEM is a safe and effective endoscopic treatment for achalasia. Um, it's been very useful for us in patients who don't want to undergo surgery or are not good candidates for surgery. Um, and increasingly in those type 3 achalasia patients where we think it works better. We've found that the efficacy of POEM is similar to laparoscopic Heller myotomy, although we do have to deal with uh, reflux frequently after POEM, which we generally are treating successfully with PPIs or with an endoscopic fundoplication procedure. And again, the modality of the treatment should really be uh, tailored towards the individual patient. Thank you everyone for listening.